woke up this morning with my mind staying on the oh, side. Okay, we are here this fine hot summer morning as we're thinking about, you know, this week was, uh, this week was the week we had the uh, summer solstice took place and we also had National Native American Prayer Day this week. So we want to think about that, uh, both those things. And, you know, it's really important that we think about those things, especially with all the challenges going on right now with the violation of sacred sites. Once again, you know, this reminds me of the struggles with Big Mountain back in the day, uh, back in the, the 80s, the late 80s, you know, we had that battle going on with Peabody Coal Company over strip mining Big Mountain, sacred grounds of the Diné and uh, Navajo people out there. And here we are again, you know, doing this same battle once more. You know, uh, remind Ruby Valley and the horses. That, that wasn't really sacred ground, but that was traditional you know, was for horses. But here we've got two, the Shoshone and down here in South Dakota with the, uh, the Sioux people. We've got two sacred grounds being violated over mineral deposits. And one of them being, and, uh, and <laughs> one's, one's for the booze and one's for the gold. You know, in our Indian traditional way, we don't work, what's inside the earth isn't as much as important as what's on top of it. What's on top of it is where we get our food, where we get our homes, where we get our families and our communities. What's in the ground is stuff. It's pretty stuff, usable stuff, but it's stuff and it's not worth desecrating holy ground. And that's what we're talking about, you know. Uh, we're talking about violating the holy ground here and we're gonna be, uh, we're gonna be looking at that this, this time right now and you gotta be thinking about that. You can go to our webpage to find out more about that, or there's not the webpage, but the Facebook page to find out more about that. Probably we'll put it on the webpage too. All right, so uh, here with me today is our co-minister for Sacred Root Native American Ministry, uh, Reverend uh, uh, Linda Two Hawk Feathers here. She's gonna help out with us today. She's gonna do our, uh, our readings for this morning as we get into our service. So I'm gonna turn it over to her now. Oh. Thank you, Bill. Um, we are reading from Psalm 77, uh, verses 11 through 20, the kind of Gita, uh, and uh, we ask that uh, Creator bless the words. I will call to mind the deeds of the Lord. I will remember your wonders of old. I will meditate on all your works and muse on your mighty deeds. Your way, O oh God, is holy. What God is so great as our God? You are the God who works wonders. You have displayed your might among the peoples. With your strong arm, you redeemed your people, the descendants of Jacob and Joseph. When the waters saw you, O oh God, when the waters saw you, they were afraid. The very deep trembled. The clouds poured out water. The skies thundered, your arrows flashed on every side. The crash of your thunder was in the whirlwind. Your lightnings lit up the world. The earth trembled and shook. Your way was through the sea, your path through the mighty waters. Yet your footprints were unseen. You led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. give your grace to the reading of this word. The New Testament reading is from Luca 9, 51, 62. Luca, um, a Samaritan village refuses to receive Jesus. When the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers ahead of him. On their way, they entered a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. But they did not receive him because his face was set toward Jerusalem. When his disciples James and John saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? 
but he turned and rebuked them. Then they went on to another village. So there was also would-be followers of Jesus that we read about here in the following verses. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds have, uh, the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another he said, Follow me. But he said, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead. But as for you, let, uh, as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Sister. Okay, we're going to, I'm going to get my handy dandy cheat sheet out here and see what's coming next. Let's see here. All right, so. Nada Leda. Ooh. Uh, Nada Nela. That's, uh, that's a pretty serious word in, uh, in our language, you know. Uh, We have in our culture a tradition. It's a spiritual tradition. It's very powerful. I've spoken about it before. I don't know how long it's been. Uh, commitments are, you know, they're sacred to us. And I know people laugh and make jokes about anything that everything's sacred to us. Well, there is a lot that's sacred to us. But there are some things which go beyond just that word. That they, uh, they are holy, you know, and uh, commitment is one of them. You know, we don't make commitments unless we intend to keep them. Because we know that the consequences of breaking commitment is breaking a promise to God. And in Galatians 6, 7, you know, Paul says, what goes around comes around. You reap what you sow. If you're the kind of person that breaks commitments, what you're going to sow is a lot of bad luck, a lot of hard times. And we know that. We believe that. So we understand these things. And when we see that kind of stuff going on, we know what's going on. So we, uh, we sit back and watch uh, ourselves. We be careful about this. We don't make commitments unless we intend to keep them. And that word, uh, my tongue's died this morning, means committed. We don't actually have a word for commitment. That is our word, committed. It's not like we're thinking about doing it. We are committed to something. All of our heart, all of our mind, all of our being is on that trail. And there's no going left, there's no going right. We stay on that trail till that is done. And so we think about that. And today we're going to talk about what it means to be committed to our walk with Edoda and Jesus. And so we think about that, you know, because Jesus has some feelings around commitments. And we want to see what that's about. I think I brought that up. Because last week we were talking about, you know, uh, lamenting loss, what it means to go through and move through that loss. And when you get through that and you're restored to that hope, where do you go from there? Well, when you have that restoration of hope after suffering loss, you have that renewal of that committed sense. You're committed to taking that next journey onto your new life, starting over fresh that way. And so we think about that in the context of our relationship with Edoda and Jesus. What does that mean? In our readings today, 
you know, from Luga, we got we got some interesting stuff going on here because King Saul knew he had to go to Jerusalem, and instead of going the roundabout way around Samaria and taking the you know the the probably easier path, not shorter but easier path to get to Jerusalem, he went straight through. He was he had his face toward Jerusalem. He was committed to go on Jerusalem, and nothing going to sway him. Not even going through Samaria, where there was a lot of hostility, where Josephus writes that there was an ongoing war between the Jews and the Samarians. There was all kinds of problems going on. Travelers were being harassed and intimidated and, and given a hard time, you know, robbed, beaten, and all that good stuff. That people back in the day used to do that way to each other and still do here in North America sometimes. But we, uh, we think about what that meant, you know, because he saw his face, they say over and again, that his face was towards Jerusalem. So he went into Samaria and he stopped in his village. And we don't know exactly what happened, but it couldn't have been good. Maybe they wanted the Jesus and the other people to stick around and do some healings and, you know, cure some folk, be of service to the community. Jesus just wanted to spend the night. He, wanted, he was going to Jerusalem. He was committed to his path. So apparently they got pretty upset about it. Things went bad and everybody refused to give them hospitality. So much so that one of the disciples was like, hey, you want me to bring down fire and incinerate this town? That kind of feeling is pretty strong. There was some hostility there between them folks. You got to think about how serious Jesus' committedness was to his cause, to his purpose. And of course then he, uh, he rebukes that disciple. So what are you doing? What are you talking about? We don't do vengeance. You know, we're not out to get even. We don't, we don't do bad for good. These people want to bring that kind of bad luck on themselves. That's their choice. They're the ones who are going to lose out. They're going to suffer by not honoring the, the sacredness of the, of the purpose there and showing respect to Jesus for who he is and what he's doing. And he knew that. They didn't honor the people in a good way. And so, uh, you know, you saw us talk before where he said, if you go into a town or a house where they don't like you and refuse you hospitality, you just knock the dust off your shoes and move on. They're going to get what's coming to them, not because God wants to do it, not because we're going to do it. They have created that energy of themselves and have put that energy out into creation on themselves. And they will reap what they have sown, as Paul says. And so... We leave it alone, and Jesus was good with that, and they moved on. But then there are some others that come up to him. Said, "I want to be your follower. I want to. I want to go with you. I'll do whatever you want. I'll go wherever you want. I'll do whatever it takes." And the first one that came up that way, Jesus said, "Nothing." According to the scripture, he didn't even say no. He ignored him as if he were not even there. Wow. That's you. What does that mean? Well, let me tell you. I've had some experience like that. I understand that. You know, in, uh, in Hollywood, you hear about all this. This is a good illustration of this. You know, you talk about Hollywood, you talk about these stars and all these singers and everybody. They've got what they call groupies. I've talked before about having, I knew one or two of those uh, groupies for the uh, Grateful Dead band, you know. And uh, the groupies, you know, they just, uh, they don't have any real sense of self. They don't have any real sense of personal purpose. No real passion for God, for the people, for improving the quality of life for others. They're just hanging out. They just want to be around the action. They're not really contributors to the cause. They're like flies buzzing around the head. They're just there. And that's sad. And Jesus knew 
right away that this fellow was one of them. So he just ignored him. Turned away to the next one. Said, you. I want you. You come with me. And the next one says, well, I got to go do this other thing, but I'll, I'll go with you, but I got to take care of this other thing. According to Jewish tradition and custom, that was perfectly acceptable. You know, you got to go bury the dead. You got to go take care of these things. You got to go say bye to family. When Jesus was talking about that, he said, one of them wanted to bury the dead. Next one, Jesus Pick wanted to go say bye to the family. These were acceptable behaviors to Jewish people, but not to Jesus. Not to Jesus. These were not acceptable. Where is the commitment? Where is the passion? Where is the desire to make a difference? It's one thing to talk. It's another thing to walk. And Jesus knows the hearts and souls of everyone that comes to him, even today. And knows whether or not what you're saying is true or false. You know, that reminds me of a story. Let me tell you a story today. A Cherokee story from the Eastern Cherokee Nation. It's one of the old ones that come, come around. It's a good story. It's about the race between the hummingbird and the crane. The old ones tell us that long ago, there was this beautiful woman. There's always a beautiful woman involved in these stories. You know. <laughs> there was this beautiful woman and hummingbird greatly loved. And so did Crane. They both loved the same woman. And Hummingbird was beautiful, fast, quick as light. And the woman kind of liked Hummingbird. Crane was awkward and not so good looking and stumbling around, not a lot of self-confidence. The woman's like, well, you know, I don't really like you. I like you just, you know, I don't, I don't want to go be involved with you. The crane, you know, he was like, I really care about you. I want to support you and help you out and take good care of you. And uh, so he was persistent that way, you know. And uh, so one day, this woman decided, she said, well, I'll tell you what. Hummingbird and crane, y'all have a race. Whoever wins... I'll marry. And they're like, wow, that's great. And Crane was like, okay. And Hummingbird thought, man, I got this. I'm fast. I'm slick. I'm mean. I've got it down. Well, what he didn't know is that Crane had endurance. Crane was slower, clumsy, but strong and steady. So the day came, all the animals showed up, starting line, because everybody knew what was going on. They were pretty, oh, this is going to be great. We'll see what happened. Well, here's the race. The woman said, okay, you all have to race around the world. And whoever comes back first, that's who I'll marry. Said, all right, we're going to do that. And so they took off. And Hummingbird, he was gone in a flash. Boop, he's out of here. Crane, slow and lumbering, rising off the ground and moving on through the air, took off. And they flew and they flew and they flew. And then all day long they were flying and then the sun went down. The hummingbird went down and landed in a tree to rest for the night. Crane, Crane kept going. All about midnight, Crane saw a hummingbird down there in the tree, and Crane just kept on floating along. All night long. And when the sun started coming up, Crane said, Well, I better stop and eat, and rest for a little while. So Crane went down and stopped and had some breakfast. Took a nap. Hummingbird comes along. Well, how did Crane get ahead of me? I don't understand that. This is about noon or so. Hummingbird kept going. Crane saw a hummingbird go past and kept eating breakfast, took his nap, woke up, took off again. All day goes long and the sun goes down and the hummingbird stops in the tree and looking behind, wondering if Crane's going to ever get ahead of him again. The old Crane about a little bit before midnight 
saw a hummingbird in the tree. It kept going all night long. The old sun came up and then stopped to have breakfast again. The hummingbird was convinced, I'm way ahead now, I'm way ahead. And later, right after, I mean it was later that day, afternoon, the hummingbird saw a crane down there. Couldn't believe his eyes. And he pushed hard, kept going. The sun went down, he had to stop again. And each day that went by, Hummingbird stopped sooner. Crane, well, he started slowing down, is what he did. Hummingbird started slowing down. And Crane would pass him earlier and earlier in the morning. And Hummingbird would catch up later and later in the day. And finally, on the last day, Crane took off after his nap, and an hour later he was passing Hummingbird, and he kept on going all day long and all night long. And Hummingbird never caught up, never passed Crane. Next morning, Crane was ready to go. Had his breakfast, took his nap, woke up, no sign of Hummingbird. He flew on up to the house, landed there with the woman, and they waited. Late mid-afternoon, Hummingbird shows up. Everybody's all right. Brain won. Pretty awesome. He's going to get the woman. Well, guess what? The woman said, I'm not going to marry an ugly fellow like you. It ain't going to happen. So she stayed single. Surprise, surprise. So much for happy endings, huh? You know what happened? The woman made the commitment and she broke it. And because she broke it, she became dishonored. She wasn't sincere in her heart, her spirit, when she made that commitment. She shouldn't have made that commitment because Jesus knows, Hidoda knows the true nature of your heart and spirit. You cannot fool him. And the woman broke her commitment. Because of that, the people knew she couldn't be trusted. So never again would any man want anything to do with her. That's the way it was. So the old ones told us. And that's how important it is when we're talking about commitment to our Creator. You never give up. Never give up to that commitment's made. When you think about the quality of your relationship with the Creator, how you're emotionally and spiritually invested in your relationship with the Creator, invested in your commitment to the Creator, you have to think about what does that really mean to you? What is your relationship? What is your commitment to Jesus really mean to you? Is it just lip service or are you actually committed to honor Him? promise that you have made to God and to Jesus in the fullness in God's intention it's something really important to think about when you walk in your journey this way and one thing to remember you know like the psalmist we want to think about the psalmist we talk today the psalmist was counting his blessings there did you catch that did you catch that you heard that song count your blessings one by one look at all the wonderful things that God has done that's what the psalmist was doing. The psalmist was counting the blessings. When you honor your commitment, when you stay committed to your path, as Jesus had his face towards Jerusalem, you know, when you stay committed to that path, then you get your blessings. It's not because there's an expectation for him, it's because God just loves doing it. That's awesome. You know, that's pretty awesome. Doesn't mean the road's going to be all that easy, that's for sure. But there are blessings there, you know. As Louise Hay likes to say, only good lies before me. You know? Or Mandy Auglin, what if it all goes right, you know. That's these things that you think about when you think about the committedness of your walk. And I've seen many, many people over the years uh, make commitments that they, they truly in their heart and their spirit weren't ready to, to 
to keep. And I've warned them. I've warned them. I've tried to talk them out of it. You don't want to commit to being a spiritual leader. You don't want to commit to doing sacred things like this. You don't want to go down that road unless you really mean it. You certainly don't want to commit to walking a, t a life with, with a dodo on the terms that are expected of you. Jesus said, love your neighbor. There's no middle ground. Honor the sacredness of God and the sacredness of all life. That's, there's no gray area there. It's not up to us to judge. It's not up, up to us to say who's in, who's out, who's right, who's wrong. It is up to us to honor our commitment. To give of ourselves that others may live. And that's what that's what is expected of each and every one of us. So if you have that willingness, then you don't have to worry about it. You saw himself said, many are called, few are chosen. He's talking about that. Are you, are you going to do what, what God wants you to do on God's terms? Are you going to do what you think you ought to be doing? Because that's really what you want to do. That's not what God's telling you. God's telling you to love your neighbor. Do right by everybody not just people that you think are your buddies who are going to get you your next job or your next promotion or who are going to support your church more than those other people. You do right by everybody. That's what being committed means. That's what it means being committed to this path. So you think about that. Are you really committed to Edoda? Are you really committed to Jesus? And if so, what does that really mean to you? Something to think about. Walking beauty. What up? So he, I woke up this morning with my mind staying on Jesus. I woke up this morning with my mind Staying on Jesus, I woke up this morning with my mind. Staying